Okay, so we're talking about lymphatics. Lymphatics, the purpose is to return fluids like plasma that's leak, proteins, um, work as part of the immune system. There's all those things. And if it doesn't work, like it gets blocked up, you have problems, and it can cause things like edema. And there are four major causes of edema. And the first one is you have, if you don't have enough plasma proteins, we talked about this last week, or actually Tuesday. When you have protein in the blood, what's it pull into the blood? When you have proteins in the blood, proteins attract something. They're a solute. What are they attracting? Water. They're trying to pull water in. When you don't have enough proteins, is the water going to stay in your blood? It's going to want to leave. So the fewer proteins you have in your blood, the more the water wants to leave. And the water is going to seep out into the tissues and cause edema. One of the problems here is the organ that makes most of the plasma proteins is the liver. So who might have a problem with edema? People that don't make enough plasma proteins who have what? Liver failure? Yep, so liver issues. Sclerosis of the liver, liver failure, fatty liver, all those things. They start getting edema. If they're on their feet all day, like working, where's the edema going to show up? At their feet, their legs. It's going to start pulling downward and then they go to bed at night and it evenly distributes across their body and it looks like it's gone but it actually hasn't. It's just distributed evenly. And number two, increased permeability of capillary walls. Histamine is what you want to think of here. When you release histamine into a local area, it opens those capillaries. So normally you have these little tiny holes in the capillary, but now the histamine is pulling the holes back. Proteins can seep out. If the proteins leave the blood, what's going to go with them? The water. So then you start having these proteins go into the, the tissue, and the water goes in the tissue and causes swelling. That's edema. And the increased venous return. So if you're pushing, <coughs> excuse me, or increased venous pressure, sorry, not return. Increased venous pressure, if you have a blockage, something that's not letting the blood flow back into the heart, all that blood starts building up or accumulating in the veins. They're the low pressure reservoirs. They're the, the low pressure in the, the uh, reserve reservoirs. So they start expanding. As they start expanding, their capillary walls are going to start backing up, or the capillaries are going to start backing up, and the walls start opening, and then it starts leaking backwards again. Another problem you get with that back pressure is what's going to happen to the veins in your legs and the lower body. They'll start stretching out. They'll become kind of distended, tortuous, which means twisted, and they call them what kind of veins? Varicose. So edema, you get backed up venous pressure and it just pushes all the fluid out into the tissues. And then blockage of lymph vessels. So there are a lot of things that can block lymph vessels. Cancer can block it. You have a growth that blocks off the vessel. You can have uh, like a lymphoma, which is a, a tumor growing in the lymph nodes. You can have a leukemia that's accumulating lots of white blood cells. You can have all these different things that are blocking up the lymph nodes. You can have parasites that get into the lymph nodes. When the parasites get in, one of the common ways they get in are through the feet. So you're walking on these little larvae and they hook into your feet and they pull up and in. Good reason not to walk around barefoot outside. They pull up and in, and they'll go to the first lymphatic they can find. So they go into the lymphatic because it's low pressure. They get up in the lymph node, and they're a parasite. They're big. It's hard for your body to eat those things. So they start building a home in your lymph nodes, and then they start building up backflow. So you have the first place you're going to see it's like in the feet. And then those parasites have babies, they move up to the next lymphatics. So you start seeing swelling in the lower legs, and then the upper legs, and then the genitalia region, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. And I took a picture out because people had issues with it, but I just went ahead and looked it up again. So here are some examples. Like that, you can see the guy's junk, right? So swelling there. But here's another really good, good picture. So the lymph nodes start blocking up here, and the foot starts, oh, where'd it go? And then the foot starts swelling, and then the parasites move up, and then the lower leg starts swelling, and they move up to the next lymph node, and that starts swelling. But you can see his upper leg, his upper body, he's actually kind of a thin guy, but look at all that swelling in his lower, lower legs. Yeah. Yep, it can be lots of different causes, but primarily a blockage of the lymph nodes. There's another example. 
and you can see all the skin's dry and flaky because it's not getting blood flow to it. All that old, stale blood's backing up in there, and it's not getting good oxygen. So it's just like being diabetic and you're not getting oxygen flow to the toes. What could eventually happen here? Yeah, they, they can get necrotic and they might have to be amputated. So the interesting thing with elephantitis is the blood flow into the foot's usually pretty decent. With diabetes, the blood flow to the foot's not very good. And the blood flow back is bad with both of them. Okay, so back on track. That was lymphatics and edema. Now we'll go into venules and veins. And these are capacitance vessels. They hold most of the blood. At any time, you hold about 60 to 70 percent of your blood in your veins. So about 60 to 70 percent. I think your book says 64. It's a pretty specific number. It's 60 to 70 percent. In fact, there's a breakdown here. You can see where all the blood's at at any time. Your heart only has 7 percent at any time. When you look at the arteries, 13 percent. But the veins, about 64 percent there. So the blood doesn't stop in the veins. It's just more in there because the veins are larger. So it's kind of like a reservoir. The venous capacity, I already said that, about 60 to 70 percent. And then venous return. What do you know about the pressure in the veins? High or low? Low. The pressure coming out of the heart's highest, going into the arteries, and then it drops going into the arterioles, and then the capillaries, it's really low. And actually, when it gets to the venules, the venules and the veins, it's extremely low. There's not much pumping from the heart that's pushing blood back into the heart. There's a lot of suction. So when the ventricles relax, they open up the valve, the AV valve, and pull blood from the atria, and then the atria will pull blood from the veins. So a lot of the blood going into the ventricles is actually because of suction being pulled back in. Did anybody get a chance to open that website with the animation? You should open it. It's really it's a good one. And if you remind me later, I'll see if I can get it to open in here again. You did get it to open? Okay. okay, so venous returns, the blood flow going back in. We called it preload, was the word we used earlier. The preload, the blood going into the heart. And here are the things that affect it. So sympathetic stimulation. When the sympathetic nervous system puts a little adrenaline on the veins, they squeeze a little. Can they push the blood backwards? No, so it's kind of like having one of those icy pop things that are frozen. You cut the top off and you squeeze from the bottom up. When you start squeezing from the sides, there's only one way to go, up. So when you squeeze the veins from the sides, you squeeze the walls of the veins, there's only one way for the blood to go, and it's up and into the heart. So venous returns affected by things like, I already said, cardiac suction, the ventricle pulling blood through the atria from the ventricle, or from the veins. Sympathetic stimulation, skeletal muscle activity. Every time you step, when you walk, your deep veins get squeezed. They're in between all these deep muscles. So when you squeeze it, it pumps it. Again, the same idea. You squeeze it with the muscle. It's like the icy pop where it ha the blood has to go up. Why can't it go backwards? Because of, of all the blood vessels, the only ones that have valves are veins. So it doesn't backflow into your feet. What's interesting is that what organ in the body or area of the body doesn't have valves in the veins? Think about it. Huh? Think about it. Why would the brain not need valves? Because the blood flow is down. And where's the blood supposed to be flowing? Down and into the heart. So you don't need valves in the brain. That's why when you hang upside down for a long time, what color does your face start turning? <coughs> like that, yeah, burgundy, purpley, nasty color. Because you don't have muscles in there flexing to pump the blood back up. It, so it stays and starts pooling in there. So muscles can work as pumps to help move the blood. The effects of gravity, like I was just saying with the brain, gravity is pulling the blood out of the brain and draining it down into the heart. And then venous valves prevent what? Backflow. So they allow it to go from one area of the muscle to the next, to the next, to the next, until it all works its way up and gets back into the heart. And I think this is kind of a cool one, the respiratory activity. A lot of people just think lungs, oxygen, but the lungs do other things. We'll talk about it next week. So the lungs are there to pump. One of the purposes is to pump blood. When you take a deep breath, you're restricted to how much your chest can move because of the ribs. So as it starts expanding out, it also expands in and smashes what? The heart's a big, strong muscle. It's not going to get smashed easily. But what about like the vena cava? Is it a big, strong, thick-walled artery? No, it's floppy. So 
when you breathe, the lungs actually smash the vena cava, and where does the blood get pushed to? Up and into the heart. Can't be pushed down, so it goes up and into the heart. So every time you take a breath, you're actually pumping blood with that breath. And then here you can see all that extra space inside the veins compared to arteries and capillaries. When you look at the muscle from one muscle to the next, you have valves in there, so you push blood from here to the next one. And then when this muscle squeezes, it pushes it up. And when this muscle squeezes, it pushes it up. Kind of like this. From one area up and into here, and then when this squeezes, it can't go backwards because of the valve, so it has to go forward. You relax this muscle, and it acts like suction. <laughs> Pulls the blood up. So if I asked you a question like this, what would be your answer? Which of the following is false about veins? How about number one, true or false? It's true. How about number two, parasympathetic activation causes constriction in the veins and mobilizes stored blood. What's wrong with that? Sympathetic, right. Remember, parasympathetic has how much control over blood vessels? None. Yeah, so no control. So it looks like number two is the right answer, but how about number three, skeletal muscle contracts helping venous return? Yeah, it pumps it up. And then veins bring blood to the heart. What always brings blood to the heart? Veins. What always takes blood away? arteries. Okay, so blood pressure regulated by controlling cardiac output, your total peripheral resistance, and your blood volume. So if you change any of these, it changes your blood pressure right away. If you constrict the blood vessels, you squeeze them down, what's going to happen to your blood pressure? If you have a tube of fluid and you squeeze on it, what happens to the pressure on that fluid? It goes up. So if you change the peripheral resistance, you're going to change the blood pressure. Your cardiac output, if your heart beats harder, what happens to your pressure? It goes up. What about blood volume? What if you drink a lot of fluid really quickly? Or you put fluid right into an IV into somebody's arm. What's going to happen to their blood pressure as a result? Increased volume does what? Increases the pressure until they pee it out. All right, so two characteristics. You have to have enough pressure that you can get all the blood to the appropriate tissues, but you can't have the pressure so high that it causes extra work for the heart because it's going to wear the heart out faster. So those are two principles you have to pay attention to. When you have thickened walls of your arteries, you increase the resistance. What's the heart going to have to do? Pump harder. Yep. If you eat a lot of salt and you take in a lot of water, what did you do to your blood volume? You increase the blood volume. What's it doing to your heart? It's making your heart pump harder. Yeah. So you don't want to do that. And you should memorize this chart. Kind of kidding, but kind of seriously. When you look at the arterial blood pressure, it has all of these things affected. You can actually just take right here, salt and water, and you can follow the pathway. Increases blood volume, increases the venous return, increases the stroke volume each time you have a heartbeat. If you change the stroke volume, it changes your cardiac output, which changes your arterial pressure. You can follow that pathway. You've actually seen every piece of this slowly over, this lecture, over these lectures. It's just all in one now. We talked about cardiac output, and I said heart rate times stroke volume, cardiac output. We talked about total peripheral resistance, viscosity, the arterial radius. There's one more thing that affects resistance. The size of the blood vessel, the thickness of the blood, and the length of the blood vessel. That's the only thing they forgot off of this. But you've seen these things before. We talked about viscosity. We talked about the number of red blood cells that are in it. That's a direct factor of viscosity. So you can put all of these pieces together. If you look at venous return, we just talked about that. Venous return is directly affected by cardiac suction, the heart pulling blood in. The blood volume, your lungs when they breathe, the muscle activity, all of those things affect venous return. You could also put in there sympathetic nerve innervation right there. You turn on the sympathetic nervous, nervous system and you squeeze the blood vessels. The veins push the blood back up into the heart, increasing venous return. Any of these things increase stroke volume, which increases cardiac output, which affects your blood pressure. So if you like flow charts, that's perfect. Okay, short-term regulation, how you regulate your blood pressure by baroreceptors. What do baroreceptors measure? 
pressure. It's like a barometer measures atmospheric pressure. A baroreceptor measures your blood pressure. All right. Clotted sinus and aortic arch are the location of the two sets of baroreceptors. So the brain's monitoring. These are at the end of nerves, the receptors. What kind of nerve do they sit at the end of? An afferent or an efferent? An afferent. Receptor, afferent, going up to the central nervous system, and then sends a signal back. So if you follow, what part of the central nervous system is the cardiovascular control center that regulates heart rate, breathing, coughing, gagging, sneezing, choking, vomiting? Medulla oblongata. So that signal goes up to the medulla oblongata, and the medulla says, let's, let's use this example. You have high blood pressure. What's the medulla thinking? Your blood pressure going into your brain is high. You don't have a lot of structure supporting those blood vessels, so what are you worried about with high blood pressure going into the brain? Blowing out a blood vessel called a hemorrhage or a, starts with an S, stroke. Yep, so you're worried about a stroke. The brain doesn't want all that pressure, so the medulla oblongata is looking out for the brain. What's it going to tell your heart to do? Slow down. What's it going to tell your sympathetic nervous system? Turn up or down? Turn down. If it turns up, what just happened to your blood pressure? It went up, so you need to turn it down. So if you follow the pathway, actually I'll show you. There's the baroreceptors, aortic arch, determining pressure going to all the body, and then the carotid sinuses going into the brain. Both of these send signals, and they measure like this. Here's this beeping signal, remember? It's like Morse code. Beep, 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 going to the medulla oblongata saying, this is a perfect heart rate, beep, 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 but then suddenly something happens, beep, 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 beep. What's the medulla thinking? The higher the pressure, the faster the beat, so it's going, whoa, this is too high, we're gonna blow out something and stroke out here. So what's gonna tell your heart to do? Turn down, what system, what branch of the nervous system is gonna tell the heart slow down? Autonomic, which branch of the autonomic is going to tell the heart to slow down? You have two branches of autonomic. The heart, not blood vessels, the heart. Can the parasympathetic work here? Absolutely it can. Parasympathetic can work on the heart to tell the heart to slow down. Can it work on the blood vessels? No, there's a difference. So it tells the heart to slow down. What's it going to tell the sympathetic to do? If you're high blood pressure, what's it tell the sympathetic? tells the sympathetic to slow down. So it increases parasympathetic to tell the heart to slow down. It decreases sympathetic to do the same thing, but the sympathetic also has control over what structures in the cardiovascular system? Blood vessels. So what's it going to do to the blood vessels? Constrict them or relax them? Relax. You start dilating. What happens to your blood pressure as you dilate the blood vessels? It starts dropping. There's less pressure on the blood, so the pressure drops. And then it's down low. Unfortunately, now it's too low. What's the heart, or what's the medulla going to think? crap. Turn back up to sympathetic, turn down the parasympathetic, then your heart rate goes up, your blood vessels start constricting, you start increasing cardiac output, you start increasing control of peripheral resistance and brings your blood pressure up. So here's just a simple path. With an increase in blood pressure, increasing the baroreceptors, the action potential is going to the brain, fire faster, beep, 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 beep. Cardiovascular control center, medulla oblongata, sends messages to increase parasympathetic, slowing the heart rate down, decreasing sympathetic, allowing blood vessels to relax. This is causing a decrease in heart rate, a decrease in stroke volume, dilation of the blood vessels, and overall you get a drop in cardiac output, which reduces the blood going to the brain, the pressure going to the brain, and also the resistance. And if you wonder what was going on with decrease, you just flip everything around. Decrease baroreceptors, a decrease in action potentials. Cardiovascular control center will decrease parasympathetic and increase sympathetic. So you just flip everything around. Everything changes exactly the opposite. So when you look at the sympathetic, what's the sympathetic have control over? The heart or the blood vessels? Both. Sympathetic. So if I turn up sympathetic, what happens to my heart? It beats faster. It also contracts stronger. So you're pumping more blood and you're beating faster. Both of those directly affect what? Heart rate and stroke volume affect what? Think. Cardiac output. You just increase both of them so you're dramatically increasing cardiac output, which increases your blood pressure. Your effect over the blood vessels, vasoconstriction. When you increase the constriction, what happens to the pressure? Increases the pressure. 
And then the veins, when you squeeze the veins, where's it pushing blood to? Back up into the heart. So you fill the heart more, what's it do to the stroke volume? If you put more blood in, it has to pump more out. Stroke volume goes up. What's that do to your cardiac output? Also goes up, increasing your blood pressure. And this is just a flow chart we've already talked about. So what happens when your blood pressure gets elevated? What happens when your blood pressure drops? And you can follow the pathway. So if I asked you a question like this, if the baroreceptors detected high blood pressure, what would happen? Without even looking, what would happen? What would you predict? High blood pressure, it tells sympathetic to, slow down, it tells the parasympathetic to, speed up. Yeah. So right away you know what would happen and look at the answers. Would the parasympathetics be increased? If you have high blood pressure, would the parasympathetic go up? Yes. That looks right. How about number two, sympathetics would increase? Well, you know those two directly oppose each other, so one of them had to be wrong. Number two is wrong. How about number three, somatic nervous system would be increased? What is the somatic nervous system? That's what kind of muscle? It's not cardiac. It's not smooth. It's skeletal, right? So this has nothing to do with skeletal muscle. Don't be tricked by the word. And then number four, nothing would happen. Would your brain just take the extra blood pressure? No, it blow out blood vessels. You don't want that. So number one has to be the right answer. All right. Other influences over your blood pressure. So this is an important one. Left atrial volume receptors. You have volume receptors that detect how much blood is in the atria. If you have too much blood in the atria, does the heart want that? No. So what do you think it's going to want to do? Is it want, going to want to retain more water? No. It releases a chemical called ANP. It's atrial natriuretic peptide. So like this. Atrial natriuretic Oops. peptide. These three letters are the key to telling you what they do. If you just look at those three letters, N-A and that thing that looks like a plus sign, what should pop in your mind? N-A plus, sodium. Atrial is where it's coming from. It's the atria releasing a something neuretic. When you think anything ends in uretic, what do you usually think of? Like a diuretic, urinating, right? What are you urinating out here? Salt. salt. If you start... So this chemical is released in the atria, it goes to the kidneys and tells it, release salt. What's automatically going to chase that salt out of your body? Water. What happens to your blood volume? It goes down. Is the left atria going to be happy now? Yeah. Yes. You had too much blood volume, you urinate out the salt and the water, the blood volume drops, and then that chemical is turned off. What kind of feedback loop is that? It's a negative. Yep, if the beginning thing and the end thing are exactly the opposite, it's a negative. The beginning problem was high blood volume. The end effect was low blood volume. They're exactly the opposite and shut the loop off. That's a negative feedback loop. A positive means that whatever starts the loop, the final thing increases that, makes it worse, like childbirth. You start a contraction, you release chemicals that cause what to happen? More contractions. Those contractions release more contractions, which release more contractions over and over. That's positive. This is a negative feedback loop, right? So atrial volume receptors, it's like a self-defense for the heart. The heart releases a chemical that goes to the kidney and says, pee out the water and the salt. Let's get this, this blood volume under control. All right, and then chemoreceptors, central and peripheral. Oh, did I skip something? I did. Hypothalamic osmoreceptors. What's the hypothalamus detecting? Water, not volume. Water concentration. It's the percentage of water to solutes. So your hypothalamus is thinking, oh my god, there's a lot of salt. It doesn't look at how much water, number of water, like volume water. You could already have too much volume, but if it sees a lot of salt in there, guess what it's going to make you do? Drink more water. It's trying to dilute that salt. It's like, oh my god, there's so much salt. Why would you eat the whole bag of pretzels? So it's going to try and make you retain more water. Oops. And then chemoreceptors. This is kind of interesting too. The central and the peripheral chemoreceptors, where do you think the central ones are going to be? Yep, in the brain. And then peripheral, you're going to have them in similar locations, like at the carotid arch and the aortic carotid arch. The aortic arch and the carotid sinus. These detect chemical concentrations. Like, for instance, oxygen. 
If you have low oxygen, what's that going to do to your blood pressure? Think about it. If you don't have enough oxygen going through your body, what's your brain going to tell your heart to do? Beat harder and faster. Why? To get more blood to the lungs to pick up more oxygen. So these receptors are sensitive to things like oxygen. And we'll talk about those when we get to respiratory next week. Number three, cardiovascular response associated with emotions. What happened to your heart? It's racing, right? You're scared. You're afraid. Your heart starts beating faster, You're trying to pump more blood to your brain, thinking, what the hell was that? And get you out of this bad situation. So emotions. You ever just had a really crappy day, and you just, you're sweating, and you're anxious, and you just, oh, everything's going wrong. Your heart's just beating. You feel like it's going to beat out of your chest, and you think, God, I just need to take a nap. Emotions. Had nothing to do with your blood oxygen, your blood volume, nothing. It's all emotional. Number four. Booga booga booga. Number four, pronounce cardiovascular changes with exercise. Obviously, what's interesting is you can start thinking about exercise and start planning to exercise, and guess what happens to your heart rate? It goes up. It anticipates. We'll talk about that later, too. Number five, hypothalamic control over cutaneous arterioles. What are cutaneous arterioles? The ones going to the skin. Yeah. And you can actually link some of these things. Like when you get scared, what color does your skin turn? Pale, right? You turn all pale because it's shutting off the blood supply to the skin. It's redirecting it to the brain and the heart so you can get out of this scary situation really quick. And that's the hypothalamus that does that. Remember the four F's? Fighting your fears, one of the F's. And number six, vasoactive substances released from endothelial cells. What was the name of that chemical that was released by the endothelial cell? Endothelin, right. To cause vasodilation or constriction? Constriction. What was the one that caused vasodilation? Viagra. What was the name of the chemical? Nitric oxide. Right. Um, what did I do here? There we are. Okay, hypertension is a fancy way of saying high blood pressure. Yep. And with hypertension, what sucks about it is those blood pressure receptors, those baroreceptors, they take a long time to adapt. What kind of receptor are they? Phasic or tonic? They're tonic receptors. But when they do adapt, they don't want to turn back. So if you've had high blood pressure for six months, a year, after about that amount of time, what's, what are these receptors saying? This must be normal. So if your blood pressure is 140 over 90 for like six or seven months consistently, if you jump on a treadmill for an hour and your blood pressure goes up to like 150 over 90, that's short term. As soon as you get off the treadmill, what's going to start happening to your blood pressure? It's going to start dropping again. But when it's consistently high for seven, eight, nine, ten months, those bare receptors go, well, maybe this is normal for us. Then you take a diuretic that makes you pee out, because that's the first thing they give you when you go into the doctor's office. They give you a diuretic to make you urinate water out. Why? What are they trying to do for you? Decrease your blood volume, which should decrease your blood pressure. And it, the, the diuretic clears out the water, but then suddenly your blood pressure starts going up. Why? Because the diuretic drops the blood pressure and your brain's going, oh my God, 120 over 80, we're going to die. We need to get it back up to 140 over 90. And so it starts raising it again. That's why they give you the diuretic first. They're trying to fix it short term. And if that didn't work, then they hit you with the big drugs. And once you're on the big drugs, you don't come back. So hypertension's adaption or adaptation of the what kind of baroreceptors? Phasic or tonic? Tonic. During chronic hypertension. Hypotension means low blood pressure. What do we call it when you have fatally low blood pressure? Life threateningly low. Shock. Yep. So circulatory shock. You're not getting enough blood going to the right places. And there are only four types you need to know for this class. One's hypovolemic, and I love it because they tell you exactly what they are. What's your problem? Low blood volume. You're sweating. Let's say you're running a marathon out in the hot, you know, Arizona sun. I don't know why I said Arizona sun. We have the same damn sun here. But you know what I mean. So you're running out in the heat, really hot, dry environment. You're sweating like crazy. Where's that sweat coming from? It comes from your interstitial fluid. When your interstitial fluid runs low, where's it get more water from? Your blood. It's diffusion. You put it outside your body, and you just shift it from one area to the next. By the way, where's the interstitial fluid in the blood going to start pulling water from next. If you don't drink water, where's it going to get next? From every 
cell in your body. So what's going to happen to your cells? It's going to start shrinking. They're getting dehydrated. Is it a good idea to drink pure water when you're in a situation like that? No. no. Because what are you doing to your blood? You're making what? Hypo, iso, or hypertonic? You're making it hypotonic. You're putting too much solute, or solutes, too much solvent in your blood. So hypotonic. When you do that, these cells that were starting to shrink, what are you going to do to them now? <laughs> Potentially pop them. So the first cells that are affected are going to be the red blood cells, and they don't like that huge change in, in volume. So things like sweating excessively, vomiting, diarrhea, even a hemorrhage. So you have massive bleed. You're bleeding out. That's hypovolemic. You don't have enough blood volume. Cardiogenic is telling you what's generating sh the shock. The heart. So it could be a weak heart. It could be a heart attack, heart failure. Number three, vasogenic. What's causing the problem? Vasos. Vessels. Right, vessels, the blood vessels. It could be um, dysregulation of chemicals, like releasing too much histamine. Histamine causes the blood vessel to dilate. If that gets in your blood and goes to all your blood vessels, what do all your blood vessels start doing? Dilating. What's going to happen to all of your blood? Where's it going to go? To your feet. Right. So vasogenic shock because of the blood vessels. Too much nitric oxide. I remember watching A Thousand Ways to Die, and there was this guy that was having an affair, and it was his anniversary, so his wife popped him a couple of Viagra. And then he gets a call from his mistress, and he goes over to her house the night of his anniversary. Talk about paybacks here. But goes over there. On the way there, he pops a couple of Viagra. And when he gets there, she had drugged his drink with a couple of Viagra just to make sure that he had a good time, and he had t taken so many Viagra that, yeah, he went into shock and died. Yeah. Yeah, if there's no blood to your brain for four hours, consult a physician. Um, or the coroner. So vasogenic shock means that the blood vessels in. Neurogenic is telling you what's doing it. What, what specific part of the nervous system is doing it? What specific part? It's the system. Not, I'm not talking cells like neurons or glia or whatever. What part of the nervous system is doing that? It's affecting the blood vessels. What part is affecting it? Sympathetic. What's wrong with the sympathetic? It's turned up too high or too low? Too low. Orthostatic hypotension. When you stand up, if you have a problem with your brain, your spinal cord, or anything going between your brain and down to your blood vessels in your heart, if you stand up and your sympathetic, or sympathetic nervous system doesn't turn on fast enough, your blood races from your heart and your head, and what do you do? You get lightheaded and you fall over, you pass out. Neurogenic. Usually it's people that have issues with their brain. Even like a really intense cold or the flu can affect the circulation to that area of the brain and affect those nerves. So if you stand up real quickly when you're laying in bed all day and you stand up, you get lightheaded and you just fall back over. So here's a flow chart. You can see them all. Hypovolemic because of hemorrhage, too much water loss. Decreases volume, decreases output, leads to shock. Cardiogenic, weak heart. Vasogenic, anaphylactic shock, which would be because of what chemical? Histamine. Septic shock, I forgot to mention that one. So bacteria. Bacteria actually have things like toxins they can release, or the wall of bacteria can actually cause your blood vessels to start opening up. So septic shock, that those toxins from bacteria in your system. And then the sympathetic nervous system um, turned down would cause it too. So if I ask you a question about shocks, widespread vasodilation triggered by the presence of a vasodilatory substance. I mean, the name kind of gives it away, doesn't it? It's what? Yeah, vasogenic shock. Okay, consequences and compensation for shock. Actually, obviously, the consequences decrease blood flow to things like the brain, the organs, and then the overall consequences death if it's not corrected. The compensation, this is where the whole body starts working together. If you don't have enough blood volume, like in hypovolemic shock, what, are the, what could the kidneys do to help you? The kidneys are going to start doing what? Stop producing urine. They're going to retain water, which goes to the blood, which causes an increase in blood volume. What's the hypothalamus going to make you start doing?
Remember the four F's? I'll give you a hint. Fornication isn't one of the things that's going to make you do. <laughs> not freezing. The feeding. But it's not specifically food. It's what is it going to make you want to do? Start drinking water. So the brain's going to start making you feel thirsty. What's it going to do to your sweating? You're going to sweat a lot? You're going to turn down sweat. So all these systems are working together. The integumentary system turns down the sweat. Your heart, what's it going to start doing? Increasing beating, right? It's going to try and bring that blood pressure up and get blood back up to the brain. So all the systems work together. The GI tract is going to turn down because it's conserving this blood for other areas. Everything works together. Lots of flow charts, right? And they're all in your text. So if you have a hemorrhage, what kind of shock would that lead to? Hypovolemic shock, yeah. You have a hemorrhage, you drop blood volume, you get thirsty because of what organ in your brain? Hypothalamus, yep. The hypothalamus also releases a chemical called vasopressin. What's it going to do to your blood vessels? Squeeze them. Your kidneys are going to release something called renin, which is going to trigger this pathway we talk about, uh, I think we start talking about next week. But it's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. It starts making you retain salt, which makes you retain water. Yep. So vasopressin, also known as ADH, makes you retain water. It squeezes the blood vessels. This makes you retain salt. Overall, what are you doing to your blood volume with these things? Increasing blood volume. You're trying to bring it back up. Over here, what effects are on the blood vessels, sympathetic's going to do what to your blood vessels if you're going into shock? It's going to try and squeeze them down. Try and compress them. And overall, the main goal is to increase blood pressure to the brain and bring water or fluids in to try and replace that lost blood volume. Until all the blood... By the way, if the sympathetic nervous system is cramping down on blood vessels, all the blood vessels except to the brain, what's going to happen to the blood flow to the GI tract? What's going to happen to the blood flow to the kidneys? It goes down. What's going to happen to the blood flow to your spleen and your liver and your pancreas? What's happening to all the organs? They're shutting down. They're getting decreased blood flow. They need that blood flow. So if you're, if you're decreasing that blood flow for too long, you get something called multiple organ failure. They just all start shutting off. Your kidneys, your liver start failing. And then you die, right? Okay, and that was the blood vessels. And the last thing for cardiovascular, we have blood. And this is a lot of overview of anatomy, but I'm going to hit with specifics that you really need to know physiology-wise. So first, the blood composition. When you take blood and you centrifuge it, you spin it around, all the heavy parts of blood go where? To the top or bottom? To the bottom. It's just like when you see those astronaut training things when they spin them around really quick and everything squeezes back. Or I guess there's a right at the, or at the carnival like that too, right? Where the gravity pulls you backwards. It starts pulling back. So when you spin this tube, all the heavy elements start sinking to the bottom. The heaviest parts are called the formed elements because the whole cells are fragments of cells. They're big chunks of things. Why red? What are you seeing the majority of this down here? Why is it red? Because it's red blood cells. Up here is the plasma. It's yellow in color. It's like straw-like in color. It has things called bilirubin, urobilinogen in it. What do you usually associate with bilirubin? Liver. What color? Jaundice. So it gives that straw-like color to your blood. Your plasma specifically. And remember, when I say blood, I mean the whole thing. I should be specific. When you spin it down, here have formed elements, and up here is the plasma. With the plasma, it's about 90% water. What's left in there are a bunch of proteins and electrolytes. You've got um, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, all those electrolytes. They're just free atoms mixed in with the water. They're dissolved. It's just like salt water, sugar water. It's all mixed up in the plasma. And then you have proteins like albumins. Albumins, the clear part of the egg, it's the same concept. It's a liquidy protein. You put it in your blood to help retain water and to help it work as a carrier. Proteins love water. Are they going to be able to easily move through water? Absolutely. What is going to want to grab a hold of these little lifesaver raft things that love water? They don't like water at all. Things that love fat, steroids like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cholesterols. They stick to these proteins and the proteins will carry them through the blood. Just like the blood's a, a waterway or river and the steroids are kids that can't swim. They hold on to those life floaty devices or whatever to get around. And we'll talk about that later too. So albumins, they're there primarily to help retain water and to help transport things. I think that's on the next slide, isn't it? Yeah, right down here. So the plasma proteins, the albumins, 
transporters carry things around. Is this all written in your notes? Okay, so I can go a little bit quicker through that. And then globulins, the primary globulins you want to worry about are called immunoglobulins. They're also known as antibodies. What is that? What part of your, what system in your body are those working for? In the limb, antibodies are also in your blood. What system in the body? The immune system. These are, when you get vaccinated, your body makes antibodies or immunoglobulins against whatever you're vaccinated for. So you have these little weapons floating around for the chicken pox, measles, mumps, rubella, all those different things. They're antibodies. They're made out of protein. The more you have, the more water you retain. They help retain water too. And then clotting factors, fibrinogen. Anytime you see a word that ends in ogen, it means it's an inactive enzyme. When we talk about digestive tract, you're gonna see a ton of these ogens over and over and over again. Actually, you see two more of them today. You'll see something called plasminogen, which means it's an inactive enzyme. We're going to talk about fibrin agen later. So fibrin makes a fibrous clot. These are all proteins, free floating. They're always there. You have to activate this one before it works, though. So when it says plasma proteins create osmotic gradient, that means they pull what? They're pulling water into the blood. You have fewer proteins, you don't retain water. When you get a burn, when you have massive burns, you open up those blood vessels, proteins leak out, what chases after it? Water, lots of water. So somebody that's a burn victim, what do you really have to worry about? Dehydration. They're losing lots of proteins which take the, the water out with it. When you see somebody that has a really severe burn in the white area, that's just like an egg white. It's clear proteins, and what happens when you overheat them, they denature and they turn white. It's the same concept. All right, and then plasma proteins, they actually have an acidic side and they have a basic side. So they find acids and bases and grab them. They help maintain the pH. We'll talk about this a lot when we talk about the kidneys. All right, so that's the plasma. When you spin it down, about 55% of your blood is plasma. Remember, you have the albumins, the electrolytes, etc. You have this little thin layer between the plasma and the red blood cells, and it's called the Buffy coat. The Buffy coat's less than 1%, and the two things that are in there, platelets and white blood cells. And then the bottom, roughly 45%, if you're doing the math, 55 plus about 1 plus about 45 comes out to about 100%. I mean, it's not perfect science, but it's about 45%. And when they give these numbers, who are they comparing it to? Female or male? A male that weighs about should actually remember this because anytime you look at a textbook, well anymore they give both numbers pretty much, but if they just give you one set of numbers as the average in the human body, they're always comparing to a 70 kilogram male. It's just across the board, the, the rule. So do you think a woman's gonna have a higher or lower hematocrit or red blood cell count? She'll have lower. She naturally has a lower red blood cell count. So hers is usually closer to 40. What do you call it when Either of them, their blood, red blood cell count gets down around 30, they're really low. They have anemia, right? Okay, so the Buffy coat and red blood cells are what we, we're going to talk about now. So these are all formed elements. They're either whole cells or they're pieces of cells. There's a red blood cell, there are platelets, which are fragments of cells. Here are the white blood cells for the immune system. And here you can see some of that fibrinogen and the clotting factors we'll talk about in a little bit. So red blood cells, your anatomy, what shape do they have? How do they describe it? It's not a round ball, it's called biconcave. Yep, the shape is biconcave. The reason it's biconcave is important. When you have a biconcave cell, it actually increases the surface area. When you increase the surface area, you increase the rate of, I don't have it burned in your brain yet, huh? Increase surface area, Fix said, increases the rate of diffusion. What are you trying to diffuse faster? on red blood cells, oxygen. You're trying to move the oxygen back and forth quickly. Increase the size, or sorry, the surface area, you increase the rate of diffusion. Hemoglobin is the protein particles inside. This is what hemoglobin looks like. Excuse me. This is just one hemoglobin. It has four protein particles with an iron molecule stuck in the middle. This is why that red blood cell always settles to the bottom. It's heavy, it's full of iron. So when you spin that out, all the iron particles start moving towards the bottom. Right, this is a heme group which has an iron, an Fe in it. This is a protein chain. When people have sickle cell anemia, it's because these protein chains don't bend like this, and it makes the whole cell misshapen. 
next point you want to have down is that one red blood cell has about 250 million hemoglobins. This is one hemoglobin. There are about 250 million in one red blood cell. Every hemoglobin can carry how many oxygen particles? Guess. Four. One oxygen particle binds to this iron, one binds to that iron, one binds to that iron, and one binds to that one. So how many oxygen can you carry in one red blood cell? One billion red blood cells. <laughs> right. When you put an oxygen on an iron, what happens when you put oxygen on the iron in your car? You rust it. You oxidize it. It's rusting. What color is that rust? Orange. Right. It's like a reddish orange color. It has that kind of glowy red to it. So when you oxidize this piece of hemoglobin, what color does it turn? Red, which makes your blood look red. When you deoxidize an iron, if you were to take and remove the iron and all the oxygen, or, or remove the oxygen from all the iron on your car, it actually turns like this bluey, purpley color. So if you actually spray a deoxidizer on, I used to rebuild Volkswagens when I was in the high school, and I loved doing it. I'd sand down the car, and then you spray a deoxidizer on it. It was cool because it would actually turn the iron this bluish purple color. So when you've deoxidized your your iron in your blood, what color does it start turning? Like this bluey, purpley color. If you still have oxygen in your blood, you don't completely remove every oxygen. You still have some red. So when you add the blue and the red, it's kind of like this burgundy, purpley, kind of cool color. If you remove all of it, you turn blue, right? All right, some other keys about red blood cells. No nucleus, no organelles. So what do you know they can't do? They can't reproduce and they can't, another reword. They can't re pair, regenerate, sounds pretty close, yeah. So yeah, they can't fix themselves. They don't have the DNA, they don't have the blueprints to make any repairs. So that means they have a shelf life. Anybody remember how long a red blood cell lives in your body? About 120 days, right. And then because it can't repair itself, it loses its flexibility and it gets stuck in two organs. What are the two organs that chop up and process your red blood cells? The spleen and the liver. The spleen and the liver are the recycling factories for red blood cells. When you recycle them, you split it apart, you take that iron, you put the iron back in the blood. You take the proteins from the hemoglobin and you turn them into something called bilirubin. What color does that give you? Like a yellowy color. And then the liver pushes that into your feces and gives it like a brown, like a yellowish brown hue. Fun fact, next time you go to flesh, just think about that. Wow, that's beautiful. I have plenty of broken red blood cells in there. So anyways, that yellowish brown color. If you want to test this out, give your friend a bat and ask him to smack you in the arm as hard as possible. The first thing that happens, you get smacked in the arm. What color does it turn? Red. Why? Because all that fresh oxygenated blood is going into the arm and seeping out of the capillaries and into the tissue. It's stuck there. So it stays red like most of the day. Tomorrow, what color is it? Purple. Because all those red blood cells are still there, but now they're not carrying oxygen. They're deoxidized. So they have that purpley color, right? And then after they have the purpley color, macrophages will come in the next couple days and eat them and break them into iron and bilirubin. So you've got this iron and bilirubin stuck in there. What color does it start turning? Yellowy, right? Jaundice. And you had kind of that green hue from the iron too, but you've got this yellowy green kind of color. And then after the macrophage have put all the bilirubin in the blood and you've urinated or, or pooped out the bilirubin, then it's back to normal. So you can actually watch all the stages of life. The only stage I didn't mention so far is the birth of a red blood cell. Where's it born at? The what bone marrow? Red bone marrow. What's the yellow bone marrow? Fat. Yep. As we age, we replace the red with the yellow bone marrow, and we just get more and more fat. Okay. How many mitochondria does a red blood cell have? I guess I skipped one thing. Well, if it has no nucleus and no organelles, how many mitochondria does it have? None. So it has to make some energy. Not much, but some. So what process does it have to use to make energy if there are no mitochondria? Glycolysis. So it has some glycolytic enzymes that help it produce a little bit of ATP. And this carbonic anhydrase is another enzyme we're going to talk about a lot later when we talk about um, the lungs and CO2. Carbonic anhydrase makes you convert CO2 into another chemical called bicarbonate. 
so that you can carry it. Because CO2 doesn't like heme. It's not like oxygen. What's kind of interesting is CO2 doesn't bind to heme, but CO binds to heme. What is CO? Carbon monoxide. It binds right here to this exact same place as oxygen. It oxidizes this. So what color does it turn your blood? Red. Bright red. So when people are dying of carbon monoxide poisoning, what color is their skin? It's like a red or a pink color. They look like they're getting plenty of oxygen, but in reality, are they? Nope, the carbon monoxide binds to that heme and won't let go. So no oxygen can bind. So they're just slowly getting tired because they don't have enough oxygen. They fall asleep and then they die. Jack Kevorkian said that the reason he used carbon monoxide to kill people was because they were they were at terminal stages of life where they always look <coughs> pale and gray. And this brought beautiful tones to their skin. So it was actually his, his way of doing justice to them. Twisted mind. Twisted. All right, which, it's funny how people justify doing bad things, right? So which one of the following is true about a red blood cell? How about it's multinucleated? So how many nuclei does it have? None, right. How about it makes 36 ATP through oxidative phosphorylation? No. Nope. It makes two through glyco glyco bleh, right, glycolysis. How about number three, it lives for 120 days? That's true. And then how about number four, is able to transport six molecules of oxygen? Mm. How many can a red blood cell carry? Right. See, it's stuck with some people, the billion. But four is the hemoglobin. The red blood cell is one billion. And the word that got caught off, I think, is in your notes. It's erythropoietin. It's a hormone. Underline it. you got to know it. So we talked about red bone marrow. That's where you make blood cells. I'm not saying red blood cells. I'm saying blood cells. What other blood cells are made in the red bone marrow? White blood cells and platelets. They're all made in the red bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow, you know, is fat. Pluripotent stem cells are the stem cells. We call them adult stem cells also. But you have stem cells in the bone marrow. Here's one. Pluripotent because it become plural or many things. Some call it totipotent too. But it can become lots of things. When you stimulate this, it's just sitting in the red bone marrow waiting. When it's exposed to a chemical, it says, oh, it's time to go to work. That chemical tells it what to be. If the chemical is called erythropoietin, what's it telling it to be? A red blood cell, an erythrocyte. So it's telling you to be a erythrocyte. If that chemical is leukopoietin, what's it telling it to be? A leukocyte, which is a white blood cell. If it's stimulated by thrombopoietin, what's it telling it to be? A thrombocyte, which is a? You're just playing off the words. It's a platelet. Yeah, so a thrombocyte's a platelet. But the key is the poietin is telling you that it's stimulating the cell to make something. The beginning tells you what it's making. Thrombo, erythro, leuco. Erythropoiesis is the actual physiological process of making this red blood cell. So what would leucopoiesis be? Making white blood cells, right. So keep this in mind. This is a trick and this will help you understand cancer, I hope. When people have red blood, or when people have this stem cell, let's say you have 100 stem cells, they can only make another 100 cells per hour. Just as a general example, it can make it way faster than that. But on average, you're making about 90% are red blood cells, about 7% are white blood cells, and about 3% are thrombocytes. If for some reason you need to make more white blood cells per hour, what do you know has to change about the other two? They both have to decrease. Leukemia means your body's making what? Too many white blood cells. Too many white blood cells, it's cranking them out. They're crap. They're worthless. They don't know what to do. They're just taking up space. But you're making lots of them. So what other two cells do you know you're going to decrease production of in leukemia? Red blood cells and platelets and thrombocytes. So what disorder usually comes hand in hand with leukemia? Anemia. What about their ability to clot? decreases because they don't have the factors in there, the platelets to do it. So hopefully that makes sense. And the same thing goes true when you take a chemotherapeutic agent. Chemotherapeutic agents are there to slow down rapidly reproducing cells. You make about 5 million red blood cells per second. Is that a fast producing cell? Absolutely. So chemotherapies are trying to turn down production of cancer cells that are rapidly pr reproducing, but it also turns down production of red blood cells, white cell blood cells, and platelets. What three problems are you going to have on chemotherapy? 
Red blood cells are down, you get anemia. White blood cells are down, you have increased risk of infections. Platelets are down, you have increased risk of bleeding out, right? So you have three risks you're worrying about. What other parts of your body rapidly reproduce and shed? What other parts of your body rapidly reproduce? And you shed them. Hair. Hair. Skin. Your skin is continuous with what other tract? Yeah. GI tract. So the GI tract, the epithelium, they're all reproducing. So guess what other three things chemotherapy shuts down? Production of skin cells, so their skin gets thin, so it's drying out. The hair, their nails get really brittle, can fall out. And what about their, their GI tract? Irritated. They have a really thin lining in their GI tract, so they have to eat things that are super, super bland, that have like no spices, because otherwise it irritates their lining and they vomit too much. That's why they don't want to eat. Their GI tract is so sensitive. Does that help? So hopefully it's the big picture you walk away with most of these things in class, not just the fact that erythropoietin, blah, blah, blah. All right, next thing you have to know is where erythropoietin is made. There's an organ in your body that detects oxygen to make erythropoietin. What organ is it? It's a kidney. In perfect sense, right? Makes no sense. So when I first learned that, I was like, how the hell does that make sense? Right? You'd think the lungs would make it. Detect low oxygen, make more erythropoietin. It's not. It's the kidney. The kidneys detect the red blood cells flowing through, but they don't count the red blood cells. They count how much oxygen is present. If there's low oxygen, they just assume you don't have enough red blood cells, so they release this chemical erythropoietin. Erythropoietin goes to the bone marrow and tells it make more it's erythropoietin, so what's it making more of? Red blood cells. Yep, makes more red blood cells. Now you have circulating red blood cells that come along to the lungs, pick up more oxygen, carry more oxygen to the kidney, and tell the kidney to do what? Stop making erythropoietin. What kind of feedback loop is that? Negative. Right on. So it's a negative feedback loop. It started because you had low oxygen. The end was you had high oxygen and turned off the loop. It's a negative feedback loop. The next cells, you may wonder why the hell do I have to know this? I promise there's always a point with what I say. Reticulocytes are immature red blood cells. So here's that, that pluripotent stem cell we talked about earlier. You shake a little erythropoietin on it, and it starts changing. Look at its nucleus changing, and that starts shriveling up the nucleus until you have this little pit of a nucleus. By the way, what happened to the organelles through this process? They're dying off. They're being shattered. All you're doing here is you're making tons of hemoglobin over and over and over, you're replicating hemoglobin. You're filling this whole thing with hemoglobin and suddenly the nucleus shuts off, it starts shriveling up and then it spits it out like a, a cherry pit. At the point where it still has a fragment of a nucleus, we call it a reticulocyte. It's not an active red blood cell yet. If you need more red blood cells, you make more erythropoietin, you start making lots of reticulocytes that are going to develop into a red blood cell, but they're not working yet. Normally, you should have about 1% to 3% reticulocytes. I promise there's a reason. So if you get sick and you feel really tired and you go to the doctor, what's the first thing they always want to do to you? Take blood. They take the blood and they spin it down and they look. They look at the red blood cells, they look at that buffy layer of white blood cells and platelets and they look at your plasma. They look for different hormone levels, they look for all kinds of things in there. When they see that your reticulocytes and they go, it should be what percent? One to three, suddenly it's 30% reticulocytes. What's that telling the doctor right away? You are making a lot of red blood cells, obviously because you are destroying or losing a lot of red blood cells. What could, you, what could be happening to you that you're losing or destroying a lot of red blood cells? Well, if you got cut on the outside, you'd obviously see a massive bleed, right? It could be a sign of internal bleeding. It could be a sign that you have, well, if you had sickle cell anemia, you're destroying those red blood cells. So you have something called hemolytic anemia. It could be a sign there's something going on. It could be a problem with your spleen that's destroying way too many red blood cells. It gives them an idea of what's going on inside. When they see high reticulocytes, they go, holy crap, you're losing blood somewhere. Have you been crapping blood? Right? So a lot of times they'll take a fecal sample and they'll look for occult blood, which means just presence of red blood cells in your, your blood, which is a sign that you have an internal bleed. Well, it's a GI bleed. Does it mean that you're not bleeding anywhere else? No, you could have damage in the abdomen and bleeding into your abdomen. You never know. But when they see high reticulocytes, they know that you're destroying red blood cells or losing them somewhere in your body. Right? 
So synthetic erythropoietin is obviously the false stuff that makes red blood cells. Who would need to take this synthetic erythropoietin besides Lance Armstrong? Well, actually, yeah, he probably needed to take it legally when he had cancer because when you have cancer, you're destroying red blood or preventing red blood cells from being made, so you take synthetic erythropoietin to increase red blood cell production. Cancer, anemic, blood doping, I guess. That's the illegal form. But synthetic's just a false form. You, usually they put this in chemotherapeutic agents so that you make red blood cells as you're turning it down. It's almost like adding gas to the fire as you're spraying water on the fire at the same time. You're just keeping it burning as much as you can. All right, the types of anemia, you have to know there are actually more types of anemia than this. But anemia in general is telling you that you have low hemoglobin. Not necessarily low red blood cells you're not carrying appropriate amounts of hemoglobin for some reason. So one thing is you could have nutritional, which obviously means you're not eating the raw materials. You're not eating enough proteins. You're not eating enough vitamins, nutrients that are helping you build these red blood cells and hemoglobin. Pernicious anemia means you're specifically not absorbing, and you need to write this word, you're not absorbing B12. You could eat a whole bushel of, of, I guess B12 doesn't come from plants. You could eat uh, a whole cow. You get most of your B12 from, from like meats because animals make it, but plants don't make it very well. So you can eat a whole cow and still not absorb any B12 because you have to have this chemical in your stomach called intrinsic factor. As you age, what do you know about the stomach lining? Is it working as well as it used to? Nothing works as well as it used to as you age, right? So. As you get older, you stop making intrinsic factor as efficiently. So you can't absorb B12. So older people have a higher risk of pernicious anemia. Who else? If this stuff's made in the stomach, you need to expose the food to the stomach with B12 in it. Who else may not get their food exposed adequately to the stomach? People that had gastric bypass, right? So how can they get B12 then? Shots. They have to get it in shots. They have to have it directly injected into their blood. That's pernicious anemia. Next is aplastic. Aplastic means not making. That means the, the factory making red blood cells not working. What's the factory? The bone marrow. Aplastic anemia means you have a defect in your red bone marrow. How could you fix that? A bone marrow transplant. There's something wrong. You could have a tumor growing in there. You could have leukemia. Aplastic anemia means it's the bone marrow's fault. Renal anemia means what organ's broken? The kidneys. How could the kidneys cause anemia? How could the kidneys not work? Kidneys not working cause anemia. They're not making erythropoietin. If they're broken, they don't make erythropoietin. Your red bone marrow is just sitting there waiting to do something, but it gets no no cue. It doesn't know to make it. So. Kidneys aren't making erythropoietin. Hemorrhagic anemia obviously means you're bleeding out somewhere. Yeah. And it's the same idea with women every month when they're bleeding and they have a higher risk of anemia is because they're losing so much blood volume. And then hem hemolytic anemia. What's the other type? What's the other problem with women and anemia? They're not taking in enough. Really? A room full of women and nobody knows what you're supposed to be eating? What's the thing in the middle of hemoglobin that you need to take in because you're losing it? Iron. Because if you're losing it, you're not recycling it. If you're just if you're destroying the red blood cells in your spleen and liver, you recycle that iron and reuse it. But if you're bleeding out, you, you've lost the iron. You need to take more iron in. And then uh, hemolytic means, what's hemo? Blood lytic or lysis means breaking. You're breaking your blood cells apart. Hemorrhagic is you're losing them. Hemolytic means you're destroying them. Sickle cell anemia is a really common cause of this. People that have splen uh, splenomegaly, which means an enlarged spleen, they also have a higher risk of this because their spleen's destroying. It's getting all this blood stuck in there and chewed up. So hemolysis, the cells stick together. They get broken apart. They start clotting and destroyed. Man, sickle cell totally sucks. If you're too cold or you're too hot, 
your cells start bending this abnormal shape like a hook. Instead of being this nice round cell that goes single file through capillaries, they start getting hook shaped and they stick together and they clump. It's because of one amino acid in that whole protein chain and, and one hemoglobin that causes it. If your pH gets too low or too high, the shell, cell shape bends and gets stuck. If your oxygen levels are too low or too high, the cell shape bends and gets stuck. So it sucks if you want to be a world traveler if you have sickle cell anemia. And then polycythemia means too many cells in the blood. Exactly the opposite of anemia. There's primary. Primary means there's a defect in the bone marrow. But not that it's making too little, it's making too many. So it's, it's similar to leukemia in that fashion is that leukemia makes too many white blood cells where polycythemia makes too many red blood cells. What's happening to your blood this whole time? It's getting thin. If you're adding red blood cells to it, it's getting thick. It's getting viscous. What's happening to the resistance in your blood vessels as you get more viscous blood? Resistance goes up. What happens to flow? It goes down. So what's your heart going to have to do in this disorder? Pump harder. So a lot of these people with polycythemia, they have heart disorders too because the heart's pushing way too hard trying to move blood. It's called polycythemia. Secondary means it's something other than the bone marrow. Secondary could be because you're a smoker. If you're smoking, you're taking in carbon dioxide. You're making it, actually, with the cigarette smoke. You're taking all these toxins in. You're displacing oxygen. The kidney doesn't know what the hell's going on, so what's the kidney thinking? You're not getting enough oxygen, so make more red blood cells, right? So you make more red blood cells to try and pick up more oxygen because you're a moron smoking in the first place. So that's one cause. Another cause is if you live at high altitudes. Why? There's less oxygen up there. So your kidney just says, well, there's less, there's less oxygen, so we need to make more red blood cells, which picks up more oxygen. That's why when you go to Colorado on vacation, the first two days, how do you feel? You're just like tired and drained. You feel worn out. And then your kidneys are saying, whoa, there's too little oxygen. Let's make more red blood cells. But when you come back from that vacation down to this level, after making lots of new red blood cells, how do you feel for the next week or so? You feel great. You know, if you're a runner, I, I remember... The first time I went to Colorado as a runner, I was going you know, all the time. I went up there, and the first day there, I was like, oh, my God, I cannot do this. So I went like half my normal distance, and I just gave up. But at the end of the week, I was doing my normal distance. And when I came back here, I did my normal distance. I was like, I have so much energy. I just felt like running and running, and I ran, and I ran, and I ran. <laughs> and then relative polycythemia is because of dehydration. Relative, this is the trick. If you look at it, in a normal hematocrit, let's say you have, whatever, 10 billion red blood cells in this unit here. That makes up 45% of your blood. In relative, or dehydration, polycythemia, you still have the same 10 billion red blood cells, but they make up a higher percentage of your blood because you have less what? Water, less plasma. So your blood's still thicker, but it's not, it has nothing to do with making too many red blood cells. It's just proportionately, you have too little water. So if I ask you a question, which type of anemia results from a substantial loss of blood? I love that word, substantial. Nutritional is because of diet sucks. Pernicious is because of can't absorb B12 because you're missing what chemical? Intrinsic factor. And we'll talk about that chemical over and over again this semester. Number three, hemorrhagic is because you just bled out, which looks like the right answer. And number four is because your blood cells are being destroyed, broken, yeah. Right, white blood cells. So white blood cells, you need to know, automatically should think immune system. They're there to fight infections. A pathogen is anything that generates suffering in you. Pathos means suffering in Greek, and gen is a generator. It's a suffering generator. You can have bacteria in your body that are not pathogens, but the ones that hurt you or harm you, pathogens. So your body is there to fight them. These will actually identify cancer cells and destroy them. But if the cancer cells look too much like you, then your body will just ignore them and pass them by. The key is making those cancer cells look foreign to your body. Because anything that's foreign, what are the white blood cells going to do? Kill it. They're going to try and destroy it. So a lot of the cancer research right now is actually focusing on looking at your specific cancer, what makes that cancer different than the other cells in your body, and then vaccinating you for your cancer. Isn't that awesome? So your body will actually attack your own cancer. 
Number three, cleanup crew, phagocytizing. So what's phago refer to or phage? Eating. Yep, these are white blood cells eating other cells. And de debris. You get a splinter in there, it's going to try and eat it. You get a clot, it's going to help try and eat that clot. These are the cells you have to know. Again, kind of a review from anatomy, but the first group are called polymorphonuclear. What's that mean? Poly means many. Morpho, morphology is the shape of things. So it's many shaped what? Nucleus. So when you look at this, look at that nucleus. It's actually technically one nucleus, but they call it multi-lobed. It's a weird nucleus. We're used to seeing one big nucleus in the middle. So here you see one, but it has that bridge that makes it look like two. So polymorphonuclear, lots of shapes. And the second part of the word is granulocytes. So they also have granules in them. These granules, these little red things, they're chemicals that stain. When you put a stain on it, it holds the stain in. So this basophil, it loves a basic blue stain. What color is it going to stain? Blue. Yep. So it's going to be really blue like this. All these little spots or granules are kind of like a bluish purple. The acinophil loves acidic red stains. What color is it going to stain? Red. So here's the acinophil, a nice red. The neutrophil likes both basic and acidic. So it likes the blue and it likes the red. When you mix red and blue, you get purple. You get a lavendery color. So this bottom one here is kind of a lavender shade, and that's the neutrophil. I said neutral fill, but it's a neutrophil. All right, now this is the physiology. The physiology is why they're there. The neutrophils are the most abundant in your system. They're always circulating. And they're always the first on the scene of an infection. As soon as you get a cut, a scrape, a nick, a splinter, anything gets past your skin, the neutrophils are right there. Boom, they're going through your blood and they smell that thing and they move into the tissue right away. So if you go to the doctor and you're really sick, and they take a blood sample in that buffy coat, that 1% is now like 10%. And they take the sample of it and they look at it on a slide and they go, oh my God, look at all those neutrophils. What do they suspect right away? You have an infection. You have a new infection. Something within roughly the last 24 hours. <coughs> Damn, doctors are so smart. And then isonophils or isonophils, these are there for allergies and parasites. So allergic reactions and parasites, these things come out. And the basophil is primarily for allergies. They release a special chemical. Their little granules are a chemical called what if they're there for allergies? Histamine. They release histamine. You get a bee sting, this basophil, basophil detects that bee venom and starts releasing histamine all over the place. That's bad news if you're allergic to bees because now all your blood vessels when they're exposed to histamine do what? Vasoconstrict or dilate? They vasodilate. So let's say you've been feeling really crappy and you go in and the doctor says, wow, you've got a lot of asonophils. Not really high neutrophils and not really high basophils, but a lot of asonophils. What is, what's he thinking or she thinking? Probably a parasite. Why not allergies? If it were an allergy, what would they see? The basophil and the asonophils in higher levels, right? So it's kind of a, it's, it's cool when you know these things because you know what to look for. And then number two, mononuclear agranulocytes. One nucleus... A granulocyte means without the granules. Two groups. The monocytes, the monocytes are inactive cells. They're just circulating, cruising along, watching stuff happen in your blood, and as soon as they see the enemy, just like they're Clark Kent, they duck into the tissue, put on their super suit, and now they're a macrophage. The macrophage tells you what they do. Macrophage. Big eater. They start eating everything that doesn't belong. They'll eat scar tissue, they'll eat debris, they'll try and eat that splinter, they'll eat the bacteria, they just eat everything. They'll eat other blood cells. If you have damaged red blood cells from a bruise, they'll go through and eat the old red blood cells that don't belong there. They smell the infection and they're like sharks on a feeding frenzy. They just go crazy. You can have them in your lungs. We'll actually talk about them. In the liver, they're called cuffer cells or they're liver macrophage. In the lungs, they're called the type, uh, sorry, uh, Alveolar macrophage, they're all over your body. So that if you breathe in, the alveolar macrophages eat the bacteria. If you digest the bacteria and it gets into your bloodstream, it goes up to the liver and you process it. All right. Lymphocytes are important because these are your real immune system. Immune is talking about memory. All of these up here, they don't care. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a just very vague general part of your immune system. 
the true lymphocytes are your memory cells. When you get vaccinated as a kid, these are the cells that remember that vaccine for hopefully the rest of your life. When you're a kid and you're exposed to chicken pox, these B cells and T cells make memory cells. The B cells will also make something called an antibody against that varicella virus. So now we're vaccinating for chicken pox, we expose to the varicella virus, and then what happens is you start making these antibodies early so that five years down the road, somebody with chicken pox like sneezes in your face and uh, you punch the kid, wipe your face off. That night you may feel a little bit sick, but you've got so many antibodies in your, your system that you don't have to worry about it. By the next day, that virus is gone. By the way, once the virus, that varicella virus gets in your neurons, it never leaves. What's it come back as later if you have it in shingles? Yeah. So to me, I always associate these with the military. The B cells are like the Air Force. They fly over the enemy and they drop these little weapons down on them, all over the place. The T cells, they're like the Marines. They love to fight. They love hand-to-hand -hand combat. The T cells want to get dirty. When they see the enemy, they don't hesitate. They go up to the enemy, they grab the enemy, and they literally punch a hole right through the enemy. There is chemicals that punch a hole in the wall of the enemy. If that bacteria is like a balloon, what's going to happen to it? Right? It destroys it. If you know a Marine, you know what I'm talking about. I used to have a bunch of friends that were Marines, and I quit going to bars with them because it doesn't matter if it's your fight or somebody else's fight. They have like this radar for a fight. It could be by the bathroom, and they go, huh? I gotta take a leak of back. And then they're gone, and they're over there trying to get involved. All right, so, big picture here that undifferentiated cell, that pluripotent cell, can become any of the cells we've talked about. It can become a red blood cell, a granulocyte, a monocyte, a lymphocyte. It just needs the proper chemical to stimulate it. So, if I ask you a question like this, which of the following is a type that actually destroys their chemicals? by releasing chemicals that punch holes in the wall. T, T cells are the ones we're looking for. A B cell makes antibodies. A macro, uh, monocyte becomes a macrophage. Neutrophils are the first on the scene of infection. And the eosinophils, allergies and parasites. Yep. Last one is the platelets. So platelets are stimulated to be produced by a chemical called thrombopoietin. Surprise. The cell that makes a platelet is actually called a megakaryocyte. Look at this monster. This is a red blood cell. Mega means gigantic. Karyocyte means gigantic nucleated cell. Karyo is referring to your chromosomes, your DNA, and everything in the nucleus. The nucleus itself is bigger than a couple red blood cells stuck together. It's huge. I love this thing. It's like this big bulky cell that's moving around, and when you need a platelet, it just sloughs the platelets off. So they're out on the surface and just shakes it off like dandruff. So you need a little bit, like Ali Sheedy in the Breakfast Club, right? When she wants to put snow on her picture, she's like, but that's what the platelet does. It's stimulated by thrombopoietin and just shakes it off. Platelets start circulating for about a week or so, and then they're processed, chewed up, and go away. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have organelles. A lot of people call them cells, but they're just fragments of a the cell. They're not a real cell. And these little things here, these are all platelets, these like teal looking things. White blood cell, platelet, red blood cell. Did I skip anything? Platelets. That's platelets are the white person name. What's the technical name? Thrombocytes, right? Next thing you need to know about platelets are there are three steps to a blood clot. So you've got the first thing is as soon as you get the cut, you have a vascular spasm. That smooth muscle around the blood vessel starts clenching down. Why? It's trying to prevent you from bleeding to death, right? So it starts squeezing down. That's the first step. The second thing is kind of cool, and it, when you understand how it works, it's interesting. Remember the lining of the blood vessels are like what stuff in your pans? Teflon, nonstick. As soon as you cut that wall, the Teflon broke. Now when you cook, the pan, cook an egg in the pan, what happens? Sticks. As soon as you have that cut and you expose the smooth muscle of the blood vessel, those clots go, or those pulleys go, what? And they start sticking all over it. They call it a platelet plug. So the platelets start cramming together. There are all these little blue things in the picture. They're sticking all over that smooth muscle and creating a clot. The next step is kind of complicated. As soon as they start sticking, they release chemicals. And I'm going to skip to the picture here. So I put these in if you like reading the details, but you don't have to. It's the same thing. Make a rip. Platelets start sticking. And then you're going to create this massive clot. So the platelets are going to start aggregate and they're sticking together. They release this platelet factor 3, which you don't have to know. 
which comes down here, this one you do have to know. It triggers something called prothrombin. Pro at the beginning of a, a hormone or a chemical name means inactive. What was the other thing that was inactive? And ogen, right? Like fibrinogen. So pro means it's inactive. Ogen means it's inactive. So prothrombin is just a protein floating through your blood. It's always inactive until it's activated by these chemicals from a platelet. The platelet turns this on. This is where it gets sticky. Get ready for a feedback loop here. So prothrombin becomes thrombin. Thrombin comes back and activates more prothrombin to be more thrombin, which activates more prothrombin to become thrombin, which activates more prothrombin to become thrombin. What's happening? What kind of loop did you just get stuck in? Positive feedback loop. Is that safe? No, this is a clotting factor. Do you want your whole blood vessel to clot? No. So this has to be controlled, and I'll show you how in a, in a few seconds. So thrombin, it does that positive feedback loop, but look what it also does. It also causes more platelets to aggregate, which causes more prothrombin to get turned on. Another positive feedback loop. This stuff's a mess. It's a nightmare. Then that thrombin goes to fibrin, fibrinogen that's passing by, and it turns that on, and fibrin becomes, or sorry, fibrinogen becomes something called fibrin that's like a mesh. It's like a fishnet. So it's creating this, like, mesh work so that anything else that's floating along, like other platelets or red blood cells, they all get stuck in this webbing, this net. But it's loose. So thrombin turns on this chemical called factor 13, which is also called fibrin, um, thank you, stabilizing. I had a total brain fart there. Fibrin stabilizing factor. So it stabilizes. It turns that like liquidy fishnet into concrete webbing. It's not going to break. So not only is thrombin turning all this stuff on, but it's also creating this solid mass of a plug. That could be dangerous. So the key chemicals here, prothrombin is activated to become thrombin, which creates positive feedback loop. Thrombin activates fibrinogen to become fibrin. Thrombin activates factor 13 to become fiber, or, yeah, stabilizing factor, fibrin stabilizing factor. And it creates a bigger and bigger clot in a positive feedback loop. So you need something to shut this thing off. And by the way, what we just looked at is down here at the very end. This is a pathway. This is a clotting pathway. It's like a train of dominoes. When you trip any of these triggers over here, it clicks that one to act that, activate that and, that and that and that and that and that and that. And it's a pathway. What would happen if I removed this domino? It stops. What would happen if I, act, or if I broke that domino? How about if I lost the ability to make thrombin? It stops. What would I not be able to do? can't clot. What do you call that disease? Hemophilia. Yeah. So any of, breaking any of these factors causes hemophilia. So hemophilia is a clotting disorder where they can't clot. It's pretty nasty too because if, I've seen some really intense pictures. When they get like, um, the one that sticks out in my mind is this kid smacked his knee and he broke some blood vessels in his knee. You don't think about it, but when you break little tiny capillaries, little micro tears, you clot those to heal them. But they can't clot, so what's gonna keep happening? They just keep bleeding. And his knee, I swear, was like the size of a, a basketball. It was just huge, because it kept losing blood into it, and it was just puffing out really big. He was bleeding to death into his knee, which seems really weird. But they can't clot, right? So, hemophilia is when you lose one of these clotting factors. Plasminogen is a clot buster, is kind of like the, the generic term for it. What do you already know about it just by looking at this name, plasminogen? It's inactive. It's not active. Plasminogen is floating through your system all the time, but it's not activated. It's kind of interesting because as it floats along, it looks for that thrombin. It sees the thrombin and says, you're a problem starter. And so it gets activated and turns from plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin's like sandpaper. Let's imagine this wall. This wall has a break in it. I'm gonna go get the spackle and I'm gonna put a big lump of like, whatever that stuff is, um, mortar, right? So I put a big lump of mortar in here, the big ugly lump of mortar. After that dries and gets a chance to heal, what do I do to that lump of mortar? Sand it off. That's what prothrombin does. It comes along and takes the outer layers off so you don't clot the whole blood vessel. If I clotted that whole blood vessel and it was right here in my arm, what would happen to my hand? Everything downstream would do what? It'd die. It'd be, you'd have no blood flow down there, it'd clot up and you'd die. Yeah, if it went to the brain, if that clot broke free and went to the brain, it'd cause a stroke. 
If it broke free and went into the heart, the cardiovascular or coronary circulation, what would it cause? Heart attack. So plasmin is like a clot buster. It shaves off the surface of that until it's finally healed underneath, and then you have that nice smooth endothelial layer again. So if I ask you a question like this one, the enzyme that activates fibrin or converts fibrinogen into fibrin is what? So what activates fibrin? Is it prothrombin, thrombin, plasminogen, or factor 13? What was factor 13? That was fibrin stabilizing factor. The fibrin already had to be active at that point, so we know it's not factor 13. What does plasminogen do? It gets activated to plasmin and then breaks it down. All right, number two, thrombin. Does that activate fibrin? Yes, why is it not prothrombin? Because that's inactive. You have to activate prothrombin to thrombin, and then you do it. And the last word is hemophilia, which we already talked about. All right, that's it, 229. What do you know about next Tuesday? No plans. Yep.